From the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders all around the world, this is a Cube Conversation. Hello everyone, welcome to this Cube Conversation. I'm John Furrier, host of the Cube here in the Cube's Palo Alto studios. During the COVID crisis, we're quarantined with our crew, but we got the remote interviews. Got great two get great guests here from Fortinet, Fortinet, Fortigard Labs, Derek Mankey, Chief Security Insights and Global Threat Alliances at Fortinet's Fortigard Labs, and Amar Lakhani, who's the lead researcher at Fortigard Labs. Guys, great to see you, Derek. Good to see you again, Amar. Nice yeah. to meet you. Hey. Yeah, it's a it's, it's, it's been a while and uh, it happens so fast. It just seems our right. day was just the other day, Derek. Um, we've done a couple of interviews in between. A lot of flow coming out of Fortinet, Fortigards, a lot of action, certainly with COVID. Everyone's pulled back yeah. home. Um, the bad actors taking advantage of the situation. The surface area has increased. Uh, really is the perfect storm for security uh, in terms of action. Bad actors are at all time high, new threats. Here's going on. Take us through what you guys are doing. What's your team makeup look like? What are some of the roles and you guys are seeing on your team and how's that transcend to the market? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So you're right. I mean, like, you know, like I was saying earlier, this, this is all, this always happens fast and furious. We couldn't do this without, um, you know, a world-class team um, at, at 40 Guard Labs. Um, so we've grown our team now to over 235 um, globally. There's different roles within the team. You know, if we look, if we look uh, 20 years ago, the roles used to be just very pigeonholed into, say, antivirus analysis, right? But now we have to uh, account for when we're looking at threats, we have to look at that growing attack surface. We have to look at where the, where are these threats coming from? How frequently are, are they hitting? What verticals are they hitting? Uh, you know, what regions? Uh, what are the particular techniques, tactics, procedures? You know, so we have um, threat. This is the world of threat intelligence, of course, contextualizing that information. And it takes different skill sets on the back end. And a lot of people don't really realize the behind the scenes, uh, you know, what's happening. Um, and there's a lot of magic happening, not only from what we talked about before in our last conversation from artificial intelligence and machine learning that we do at FortiGuard Labs and automation, uh, but the people. And so today we want to focus um, on the people and, and talk about, uh, you know, how um, on the back ends we approach a particular threat. Uh, we're going to talk to the, the world of ransom and, and ransomware, and look at how we dissect threats, how we correlate that, how we use tools in terms of threat hunting as an example, and then how we actually take that uh, to that last mile and, and make it actionable so that, you know, customers are protected. Uh, we share that information with key threat intel sharing partners. Uh, but again, it comes down to the people. We never have enough people uh, in the industry. There's a big shortage, as we know, uh, but it, it's a really key critical element. And, and we've been building these training programs uh, for you know over a decade uh, within 40 Guard Labs. So, you know, you know, John, th th this to me is why exactly why I always say, and I'm sure Mark can share this too, that there's never a, a dull day in the office. I know we hear that all the time, but I think today, um, you know, all the viewers will really get a, a, an idea of why that is because it's, it's very dynamic. And on the back end, there's a lot of things that we're doing uh, to, to get our, our, our hands dirty with this. You know, the old expression in startup land, Silicon Valley is if you're in the arena, that's where the action is. And it's different than sitting in the stands, watching the game. You guys are certainly in that arena. And you, got, we've talked, and we cover your um, your threat report that comes out um, frequently. Yep. But for the folks that aren't in the weeds on all the nuances of security, can you kind of give the 101 ransomware? What's going on? What's the state of the ransomware situation? Um, set the stage because that still continues to be threat. I don't go a week, but I don't read a story about another ransomware and then it leaks out, yeah, they paid 10 million in Bitcoin or, or something like, I mean, this is real, that's a real ongoing threat. What is it? Yeah, Bitcoin's quite a bit, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give sort of the 101 and then maybe we can pass it to Amar who's on the front lines dealing with this every day. You know, if we look at the world of, um, I mean, first of all, the concept of ransom, obviously with people, that that has gone extended way, way before, um, you know, cybersecurity, right? Um, in, in the world of physical crime. Um, so of course, uh, you know, the, the world's first ransom where uh, virus is actually called PC Cyborg. This is in 1989. The ransom payment was demanded through a PO box from, I believe it was Panama City at the time. Not too effective on floppy disks, um, very small audience, not a big attack surface. Didn't hear much about it for years. Um, 
you know, in uh, really it was around 2010, we started to see ransomware becoming prolific. And what they did was what cyber criminals did was shift on success from a fake antivirus software model, which was, uh, you know, popping up a whole bunch of, you know, said your, your computer is infected with 50 or 60 viruses, pay us, we'll give you a, a, an antivirus solution, which was, of course, fake. You know, people started catching on, you know, the gig was up, people caught on to that. So they weren't making a lot of money selling this fraudulent software. Uh, enter ransomware. And this is where ransomware really started to take hold because it wasn't optional to pay for the software. It was mandatory almost for a lot of people because they were losing their data. They couldn't reverse engineer the decrypt. The, uh, the encryption kind of decrypt it with any universal tool ransomware today is very rigid uh, we just released our, our threat report for the first half of 2020 and uh, we saw we've seen things like master boot record MVR ransomware this is persistent it sits before your operating system when you boot up your computer so it's hard to get rid of um, very strong um, you know public private key cryptography that's being so each victim is infected with the different key as an example. The list goes on and, and um, you know, I'll, I'll save that for, for the demo today. But that's basically, it's, it's, very, it's prolific. And we're seeing shit, not only just ransomware attacks for data, we're now starting to see ransom for extortion, uh, for uh, targeted ransom cases that are going after, you know, critical uh, business. Essentially, it's like a DOS holding revenue streams for ransom too. So the ransom demands are getting higher because of this as well. Yeah. So it's complicated. Yeah, and I was mentioning, Amar, I want you to weigh in. I mean, you know, 10 million is a lot. And we reported early in this month, Garmin was the company that was hacked. IT got completely locked down. They pay 10 million. Um, you know, Garmin makes all those you know, devices. And as we know, this is impact, and that's real numbers. Right? I mean, there's some other little ones, but for the most part, it's new, it's, you know, a, a pain in the butt to full on business disruption and extortion. Can you explain how it all works before we, get it, before we go to the demo? You know, you're, you're absolutely right. It is a big number and a lot of organizations are willing to pay that number to get their data back. Essentially, their organization, their business is at a complete standstill when they don't pay, all their files are inaccessible to them. Ransomware in general, what it does end up from a very basic overview is it basically makes your files not available to you. They're encrypted, they have a essentially a passcode on them that you have to have the correct passcode to decode them. A lot of times that's in a form of a program or actually a physical uh, password you have to type in, but you don't get that access to get your files back unless you pay the ransom. A lot of corporations these days, they are not only paying the ransom, they're actually negotiating with the criminals as well. They're trying to say, oh, you want 10 million? How about 4 million? Sometimes that goes on as well. But it's, uh, it's something that organizations know that if they don't have the proper backups and, and uh, the hackers are getting smart, they're trying to go after the backups as well. They're trying to go after your duplicate files. So sometimes you don't have a choice and organizations will, will pay the ransom. And it's, you know, they're smart, it's a business. They know the probability of buy versus build or pay versus rebuild. So they kind of know where to attack. They know the, the tactics and they was vulnerable. It's not like just some kitty script thing going on. This is real, sophisticated stuff. It's, and, it's, and it's highly targeted. Can you talk about some use cases there and what goes on with that kind of uh, attack? Absolutely, the cyber criminals are doing reconnaissance. They're trying to find out as much as they can about their victims. And what, what happens is they're trying to make sure that they can motivate their victims in the fastest way possible to pay the ransom as well. Uh, so there's a lot of attacks going on. We usually, what we're finding now is ransomware is sometimes the last stage of an attack. So an attacker may go into an organization. They may already be taking data out of that organization. They may be stealing customer data, PII, which is personal identifiable information, such as social security numbers or, or driver's licenses or credit card information. Once they've done their entire attack, once they've gone everything they can, a lot of times their end stage, their last attack is ransomware and they encrypt all the files on the system and try and try and motivate the victim to pay as fast as possible and as much as possible as well. You know, it's interesting, I was talking to my buddy the other day, it's like casing the joint, they, just, they check it out, they do their recon, reconnaissance, they go in and identify what's the move, best move to make, how to extract the most out of the victim, in this case, the target. Um, and it really, is, I mean, it's, you know, it's just to go on a tangent, you know, why don't we have the right to bear our own arms? Why can't we fight back? I mean, at the end of the day, Derek, this is like, who's protecting me? 
I mean, you know, I mean yeah. do I have to protect my own, build my own army or does the government help us? I mean, at, at some point, I got a right to bear my own arms here, right? I mean, this is the whole security paradigm. Yeah, so, I mean, there, there's a couple of things, right? So first of all, I, this is exactly why we do a lot of it. I was mentioning the, the skill shortage in cyber cyber security professionals as an example this is why we do a lot of the heavy lifting on the back end um obviously from a defensive standpoint you, you obviously have the red team blue team aspect how do you uh first um you know there, there's ways to fight back by being defensive as well too and also by um you know in the world of threat intelligence one of the ways that we're fighting back is not uh necessarily by going and hacking the bad guys because that's illegal and, jurisdictions right uh, but how we can actually find out who these people are hit them where it hurts freeze assets go after money laundering networks you know, follow the cash transactions where it's happening this is where we actually work with key law enforcement partners such as interpol as an example this is the world of threat intelligence this is why we're doing a lot of that intelligence work on the back end so there's other ways to actually go on the offense without necessarily um, weaponizing it per se, right? Like he's using, um, you know, bearing your own arms, as he as he said. Um, there, there's different forms that people may not be aware of with that, and and that actually gets into the world of, you know, if you see attacks happening on your system, how how you can use security tools and collaborate with threat intelligence. Yeah, I think uh, that I think that's the key. I think the key is these new sharing technologies around collective intelligence is going to be uh, a great way to kind of have more of an offensive collective strike. But I think fortifying the defense is critical. I mean, that's there's no other way to do that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the the you know we say this almost every week, but it's in, in simplicity. Our goal is always to make it more expensive for the cyber criminal to operate, and there's many ways to do that, right? You can be you can be a pain to them by by having a very rigid, hardened defense. That means that if if it's too much effort on their end, I mean, they have ROIs in their in their sense, right? If it's too much effort on their end, they're going to go knocking somewhere else. Um, there's also, um, you know, uh, as I said, um, things like disruption. So ripping infrastructure offline that cripples them. Yeah, it's whack-a-mole. They're going to set up somewhere else. But then also going after people themselves. Um, again, uh, the, the, the cash networks, these sorts of things. So it's sort of a holistic approach between any. Hey, it's an arms race. Better AI, better cloud scale always helps. You know, it's a ratchet game. Okay, Amar, I want to get into this video. It's a ransomware four minute video. I'd like you to take us through, as you're the lead, you're the lead researcher, take us through this video and uh, explain what we're looking at. Let's roll the video. All right, sure. Uh, so what we have here is we have the victim's desktop over here. Uh, we have a couple of things on this victim's uh, desktop. We have a, a batch file, which is essentially going to run the ransomware. Uh, we have the payload, which is the code behind the ransomware. And then we have uh, files in this folder. And this is where you would typically find user files. In a, a real world case, this would be like Microsoft, your Microsoft Word documents or your PowerPoint presentations. Over here, we just have a couple of text files uh, that we've set up. We're going to go ahead and run the ransomware. And uh, sometimes attackers, what they do is they disguise this, like they make it look like a like important Word document, they make it look like something else. But once you run the ransomware, you usually get a ransom message. And in this case, the ransom message says, your files are encrypted. Uh, please pay this uh, money to this Bitcoin address. That obviously is not a real Bitcoin address. Uh, usually they look a little more complicated, but this is our fake Bitcoin address. But um, you'll see that the files now are encrypted. You cannot access them. Uh, they've been changed. And unless you pay the, the ransom, uh, you don't get the files. Now, as researchers, we, we see files like this all the time. We see ransomware all the, all the time. So we use a variety of tools, internal tools, custom tools, as well as open source tools. And what you're seeing here is an open source tool. It's called the Cuckoo Sandbox. And it shows us the behavior of the ransomware, what exactly is the ransomware doing. In this case, you can see just clicking on that file launched a couple of different things. It launched basically a command executable, a PowerShell. It launched our Windows shell. And then it did things on the file. It basically had registry keys. It had uh, network connections. It uh, changed the disk. So this kind of gives us a behind the scenes look at, at all the processes that's happening on the ransomware. And just that one file itself, like I said, does multiple different things. Now, what we want to do as researchers, we want to categorize this ransomware into families. We want to try and determine the actors behind that. So we dump everything we know in the ransomware in these central databases. 
and then we mine these databases. What we're doing here is we're actually using another uh, tool called Maltigo, and uh, we use custom tools as well as uh, commercial and open source tools. But but this is a uh, open source and commercial tool. But what we're doing is we're basically taking the ransomware and we're asking Maltigo to look through our database and say, like, do you see any like files or do you see any types of incidences that have similar characteristics? Because what we want to do is we want to see the relationship between this one ransomware and anything else we may have in our system, because that helps us identify maybe where the ransomware is connecting to, where it's going to, other processes that it may be doing. In this case, we can see multiple IP addresses that are connected to it. So we can possibly see multiple infections. We can block different uh, external websites if we can identify a command and control system. We can categorize this to a family. And sometimes we can even categorize this to a threat actor that has claimed responsibility for it. Uh, so it's essentially visualizing all the connections and the relationship between one file and everything else we have in our database in this example. Of course, we I'd put this in multiple ways. Uh, we can uh, save these as reports as PDF type reports or uh, you know, usually HTML or other searchable data that we have back in our systems. And then the cool thing about this is this is available to all our products, all our researchers, um, all our specialty teams. So when we're researching botnets, when we're re researching file-based attacks, when we're researching um, you know, IP reputation, we have a lot of different IOCs or indicators of compromise that we can correlate where attacks go through and maybe even detect new types of attacks as well. So the bottom line is you got the tools using a combination of open source and commercial products to look at the patterns of all ransomware across your observation space. Is that right? Exactly. I showed you like a very simple demo. It's not only open source and commercial, but a lot of it is our own custom developed products as well. And when we find something that works, that logic, that, that technique, we make sure it's built into our own products as well. So our own customers have the ability to detect the same type of threats that we're detecting as well. At FortiGuard Labs, the intelligence that we acquire, that product, that product of intelligence, gets consumed directly by our products. All right, so take me through what, what's actually going on, what it means for the customer. So FortiGuard Labs, you're looking at all the ransomware, you're seeing the patterns. Are you guys proactively looking? Is it, is it you guys are researching? You look at something, pops on the radar. I mean, take us through what is what, what, what goes on and then how does that translate into um, a customer notification or impact? So, so yeah, John, if, if you look at a, a typical life cycle of these attacks, there's always proactive and reactive. That's just the way it is in the industry, right? So of course, we try to be as proactive as possible. Uh, we do some of the solutions we talked about before. And if you look at an incoming threat, um, first of all, you need visibility. You can't protect or analyze anything that you can't see. So you got to get um, your hands on visibility. We call these IOCs, indicators of compromise. So this is usually something like uh, 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 an actual executable file, like the a virus or the malware itself. Um, it could be other things that are related to it, like websites that could be hosting the malware as an example. So once we have that seed, we call it a seed, we can do threat hunting from there. So we can analyze that, right? If, if it's a, a piece of malware or a botnet, we can do analysis on that and discover more malicious things that this is doing. Then we go investigate those malicious things. And we really, you know, it's similar to the world of, of CSI, right? Yeah. Uh, these these different dots that they're connecting. We're doing that at hyperscale. Um, and we use that through these tools that Amar was talking about. So it's really a life cycle of, of getting, uh, you know, the malware incoming, seeing it first, um, analyzing it, and then uh, doing action on that, right? So it's sort of a three-step process. And the action comes down to what Amar was saying, waterfalling that to our customers so that they're pr uh, protected. But then in tandem with that, we're also going further and um, sharing it if, if, if applicable to say law enforcement partners, um, other yeah. threat intel sharing partners too. And um, it's not just humans doing that, right? So the proactive piece, again, this is where it comes to artificial intelligence, machine learning. Um, there's a lot of cases where we're automatically doing that analysis without humans. So we have AI systems that are analyzing and actually creating protection on its own too. So it's, yeah. it's uh, quite interesting that way. It's interesting, at the end of the day, you want to protect your customers. And so this renders out, if I'm a Fortinet customer across the portfolio, the goal here is to protect them from ransomware, right? That's the end game. Yeah, and that's a very important thing when you start talking these big dollar amounts that we were talking earlier. But 
it comes to uh, the damages that are done from ransom attacks. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, not only is it good insurance, it's just good to have that fortification. All right, so Derek, I got to ask you about the term "the last mile" because, you know, we were before we came on camera. You know, I'm 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 a bandwidth junkie. I always want more bandwidth. So, the last mile used to be a term for last mile to the home, where there was telephone lines. Now it's fiber and Wi-Fi. But what does that mean right. to you guys in security? Is that does that mean something specific? Yeah, yeah, abs absolutely. Yeah. The easiest way um, to describe that is actionable, right? So uh, one of the challenges in the industry is we live in a very noisy industry when it comes to um, cybersecurity. And what I mean by that is the, because of that growing attack surface um, and you know, you have these different attack vectors. You have attacks not only coming in from email, but websites from you know, DOS attacks. There's, there's a lot of volume that's just going to continue to grow is the world of 5G and OT. Um, so what ends up happening is when you look at a lot of security operation centers for customers, as an example, um, there are, it's very noisy. It's, um, you can guarantee almost every day you're going to see some sort of probe, some sort of attack activity that's happening. And so what that means is you get a lot of detection events, a lot of logs. And when you have this worldwide shortage of security professionals, you don't have enough people to process those logs and actually start to uh, say, hey, this looks like an attack. I'm going to go investigate it and block it. So this is where the last mile comes in because a lot of the times that the, you know these logs, they, they light up like Christmas, right? I mean, there's a lot of events that are happening. How do you prioritize that? How do you automatically add action? Because the reality is if it's just humans doing it, uh, that last mile is often, going back to your bandwidth terms, yeah. um, there's too much too much latency, right? Yeah. So, so how do you reduce that latency? That's where the automation, the AI machine learning comes in to, to solve that last mile problem, to automatically add that protection. It's especially important because you have to be quicker than the attacker. Um, it's an arms race, like you said, right? You know, I think what you guys do with FortiGuard Labs is super important, um, not only for the industry, but for society at large, as you have kind of all this, you know, shadow, cloak and dagger kind of attack systems, whether it's national security, international, or just for, you know, you know, mafias and racketeering and, and the bad guys. Can you guys take a minute and explain the role of FortiGuard specifically and, and why you guys exist? I mean, obviously there's a commercial reason. You bolt on the Fortinet that, you know, trickles down into the products. That's all good for the customers, I get that. But there's more to FortiGuard than just that. Can you guys talk about this trend and the security business? Because it's very clear that there's a, you know, a, a collective, sharing culture developing rapidly for a societal benefit. Yeah. Can you take a minute to explain sure. that? Yeah, sure, I'll, I'll give my thoughts, Mario. You can uh, add some, some color to that too. Uh, See, so, you know, for, from my point of view, I mean, there, there's various functions. So we've just talked about that last mile problem. That's the the, the commercial aspect. We create uh, through 40 Guard Labs, 40 Guard services that are dynamic and um, updated to security products because you need intelligence products to be able to protect against intelligent attacks. That's just the defense. Again, going back to how can we take that further? I mean, we're not law enforcement ourselves. Um, we know a lot about the bad guys and, and the actors because of the intelligence work that we do, um, but we can't go in and, and prosecute. Um, we can share knowledge and we can train prosecutors, right? This is a big challenge in the industry. A lot of prosecutors don't know how to take cybersecurity courses to court. And because of that, a lot of these cyber criminals reign free. And that's been a big challenge in the industry. So, uh, you know, this has been close to my heart. Over 10 years, I've been building a lot of these key uh, relationships between private public sector, as an example, but also private sector, things like Cyber Threat Alliance. We're a founding member of the Cyber Threat Alliance. We have over 28 members in that alliance. And it's about sharing intelligence to level that playing field because attackers roam freely. Um, what I mean by that is there's no jurisdictions for them. Cybercrime has no borders. Um, they can do a million things uh, wrong and they don't care. We do a million things right, one thing wrong, and it's a challenge. So there's this big collaboration. This is a big part of FortiGuard. Why it exists too is to make the industry better, to to you know work on protocols and automation and and really fight fight this together while remaining competitors. I mean, we have competitors out there, of course, um, and it, so it, it comes down to that last mile problem. John is like we can share intelligence within the industry, but it's only intelligence is just intelligence. How do you make it useful and actionable? That's where it comes down to technology. And Amar, what's your take on this um, societal benefit? Because, you know, I've been saying since the Sony hack years ago that 
You know, when you have nation states, they, if they put troops on our soil, the government would respond. Um, but yet virtually they're here and the private sectors to fend for themselves. There's no support. So I think this private public partnership thing is very relevant. I think it's ground zero of the future build out of policy because you know we pay for freedom. Why don't we have cyber freedom if we're going to run a business? Where's our help from the government? We pay taxes. So again, if a military showed up, you're not going to see you know companies fighting the foreign enemy, right? So again, this is a whole new changeover. What's your thought? It though? really is. You have to remember that cyber attacks puts everyone on an even playing field, right? I mean, you don't, now don't have to have a country that has invested a lot in weapons development or nuclear weapons or anything like that, right? Anyone can basically come up to speed on uh, cyber weapons as long as they have an internet connection. So it, it evens the playing field, which makes it dangerous, I guess, for uh, our, our enemies. Uh, you know, but absolutely, I think a, a lot of us, you know, from a personal standpoint, a lot of us have seen, researchers have seen organizations fail through cyber attacks. We've seen the frustration. We've seen like, you know, besides organization, we've seen people like, just like grandmas lose their pictures of their, uh, you know, of their loved ones because they, they can't, they've been attacked by ransomware. I think we take it very personally when people like innocent people get attacked and we ha make it our mission to make sure we can do everything we can to protect them. Uh, but but I will add that uh, the, the at least here in the U.S. the federal government actually has a lot of partnerships and a lot of programs to help organizations with cyber attacks. Uh, the U.S. CERT is always continuously updating uh, you know organizations about the latest attacks. InfraGuard is another organization run by the FBI, and a lot of companies like Fortinet and even a lot of other security companies participate in these organizations, so everyone can come up to speed and everyone can share information so we all have a fighting chance. It's a whole new wave paradigm. You guys are on the cutting edge. Derek, always great to see you. Mark, great to meet you remotely. Looking forward to meeting in person when the world comes back to normal. As usual, thanks for the great insights. Appreciate it. All right, thanks John, it's a pleasure as always. Okay, CUBE Conversation here. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. Great insightful conversation around security ransomware with a great demo. Check it out from Derek and Amar from Fortinet Guard Labs. I'm John Furrier, thanks for watching.